to Taking Your Health Back on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Wendy Lowe. Today on my show, we have a dear, dear friend, and her name is Susan. Thus, the title of our talk today is Susan Scott, starting the conversation. What are the wounds in society and how can we heal them? Susan wants to share this thought with you. Healing starts with starting the conversation and changing the vocabulary. So just listen to those wise words because it'll make a world of difference the next time you want to talk to somebody. So let's get started. Susan, I've known you for many, many years, but I know my audience, they want to get to know you too. So can you just share a little bit about yourself with us? Absolutely, Wendy. Thank you so much for having me. And yes, many years. That would be 29 years since we have been friends. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Um, I'm here today. I, I do this great talk and it's called Start the Conversation. And, and for me, this work started back in my 30s when I had experienced some life-changing events. And it was then that I started to really pay attention to those around me and becoming a little bit more aware of their needs and also their behaviors. As a society, it's human nature. When we see people acting out or if we're walking down the streets and someone's talking to themselves, it's very natural for us to attach that label crazy or to keep a distance, right? Because we just don't understand what's going on and it looks weird, it sounds weird. And we attach all these negative, um, again, labels and then the conversations we have about it, it just perpetuates this energy that can be very hurtful to our society. Right. Uh, so it was then at that point where I started sitting down and I just started asking questions and listening to people and really developing a space where I could listen with an open heart. And at that point, I just decided from here on out, I'm going to work on my labels. I'm going to work on how I have conversations when I talk about others and just being a little bit more responsible about that energy. Wow. And, you know, you hit it right on the nail. I mean, speaking to someone, taking time to just saying hi and how are you and really wanting to know, not just another phrase you pass out, you know, loosely like, hi, how are you? And then you're walking away. Hey, how are you? And when they start engaging, they want to talk story too. And that's um, what we're really desiring the most, especially we really saw that um, going through COVID and the need for people to just have human relationships again. And what is the best way to have a relationship? Communicating and starting a conversation. So you've hit it right on the nail, Susan. So please share a little bit about your need to start the conversation. Absolutely. It's uh... It, there was a time where that I was just surrounded by a bunch of individuals that I could just feel that there was a lot of hurt. I could feel that there was a lot of um, masking some pain. And often at times when I would hear conversations and I would just hear a lot of vulgarity, I would see these behaviors. And so I just wanted to just spend some time with them to see where it was coming from. And at this point, I started meeting some really, I, and again, I have to be careful with these labels because society would call them nuisance to society, um, offenders, but I found them to be some of the most beautiful and incredible individuals I've ever met in my life. And I like to tell the story about this young woman that her name is Christina, beautiful, beautiful girl. And when she was 11 years old, her parents had passed away. They had both died in a car accident and her uncle became her guardian. And at the age of 11, she went to go live with them. And instead of being a parent or taking care of her, he exploited her. He put her in these sex videos. And in order to get her to comply, he would give her crystal meth methamphetamine. And by the time she was 12 years old, her whole life has now changed. She's an addict and she just lost her whole childhood. By the time she was 17, she had four daughters and she didn't know, she had not developed life skills. She, life skills. she had really not had much of an education, but she knew enough to take these girls and take them out of this home and somehow protect them. So the only place that she knew to go was an encampment and she set up a tent. And the only way that she knew how to provide for these four girls was through prostitution. And the only way that she knew how to get through that was by taking drugs. 
And all of a sudden people started paying attention with to her and these four girls. And they started attaching all these labels that she was a hoe, that she was an addict, that she was homeless, that she was a bad mom. So, you know, instead of anybody at any point ever like sitting down with Christine and learning what her story was, it was all this negative um, conversation and energy going on around her. Eventually CPS was called and these four girls were taken from her and it just had this bigger hole in her life. And she didn't know how to fill it except with all these unhealthy behaviors. And she delved into even more of her addiction. And the only way she knew how to keep that up was now getting into criminal behaviors where she was breaking into cars and breaking into homes. And eventually she ended up in prison. After she did her time, she was now released, but nobody wanted to hire her because now on top of it, being an addict, being homeless, being a bad mom, she's now a criminal, a thief, an offender. And uh, she was just really, really struggling. So she was in the system for quite a while, going in and out of the prison system. But there was never a time where anybody ever sat down with her and just let her know, like, I'm here from you and, and basically just validated her loss. Right. So eventually she got into a, a shelter in a women's program where she started addressing her trauma and her abuse. She went through drug rehabilitation, learned some employment skills, actually went through the KCC culinary arts program and uh, is now doing her best to reintegrate and hopefully do so with integrity. Um, so it's, it's, it was then after hearing her story that I needed to start having this conversation. Hopefully at this point we can sit down and we can have this conversation where it's, it's with compassion and with an open heart. Uh, and again, that word, uh, that term open heart, um, that's all they need. That's all they want. And that's pretty much what will be the beginning of a start is someone listening to their story and their heart and not labeling them or condemning them but really having a compassionate heart to who they are. And they are human beings, just like we are. They have a different story. We all have different stories. But the fact that you took the time, Susan, to sit down and hear her heart, and then she felt your heart. And that's where mm -hmm. healing comes from. And I, I know that's exactly what, uh, what, what joy it gives you because you know the, the, what, the impact that you're making with these ladies. Uh, so I, I commend you. Susan, for taking the time to make the relationship and the conversations with these women and men as well. I know that you also speak to a lot of veterans. Um, and I know that that's very difficult uh, as well, another difficult journey that you're on. Um, but you're the right person. You have that compassionate heart and the desire. So where did you meet? You have a bunch of uh, big, uh, photos with veterans. Where did you meet these veterans that are uh, presently unsheltered? So I have a really dear friend. Her name is Nani Medeiros, and she is the know, executive Nani. director, oh. right? She's right. one of the most beautiful, beautiful. souls you'll yes. ever meet, not yes. just on the outside, but yes. her heart is just gorgeous. Yes. She's the executive director of this great organization called Homemade Hawaii. And this, um, this nonprofit is comprised of basically all these developers here on the island, whether it be Castle and Cook, Stanford Carr, Howard Hughes, they all got to better, together and, and started addressing our needs in our community and addressing homelessness, those that are living on the streets. They're building these homes, but yet a lot of the individuals here in Hawaii, unfortunately, cannot afford it. So they um, took it upon themselves to provide funding and contractors and even supplies to either build shelters or um, assist the existing shelters that are in place and refurbish them, renovate them, put on new roofs. They also worked like with Ho'ala Nupua out at sunset and they put on the roofing for the safe haven that is now open for young children that have been sexually trafficked, sex trafficked. Um, and they have this great construction site out at Kalimua that they're building 36 tiny homes that will end homelessness for veterans that are experiencing homelessness. It's not a temporary shelter. It's not where they could only live there six months or two years. If they choose to, to live there for the rest of their lives, they can. And it's such a cute little community out there. Um, it's really, really special. I'll, I'll go a little bit more because I think I have some pictures of them. Wow. Uh, That's, I mean, I just gotta, again, thank you. I gotta thank Nani, give her a shout out. 
yes. who are doing this um, Hawaii homemade, um, homemade Hawaii, and um, her heart, and the fact that you're her buddy, to just encourage her along, as I know she must have had some, you know, roadblocks and stumbles, but that she has a buddy partnering with her and her heart to make this happen for the veterans out there. So congratulations to all yeah. the partners that have made this uh, possible. And I know it's a whole tribe that makes it happen for these uh, young men and women. Um, so Susan, in our next slide, I need to ask you, where was this taken and who are you with? Awesome. So I, uh, pre-COVID, I was able to go to a few schools and talk about recognizing the needs in our conversation, in our community. And again, it was starting the conversation because it's this generation that's going to be um, going forward and addressing those societal wounds that we're experiencing right now, whether it be domestic violence, whether it be homelessness, whether it be, um, you know, kids that are, are presently being being trafficked here in Hawaii. So I, I walked in and I, my first question with them was, you know, what are the needs in our society? What have you recognized? And it was basically, again, just getting them talking and thinking. And one of the things that I asked is as we start this conversation, let's shift our vocabulary a little bit. So it's very easy to use the word homeless. However, it has a negative connotation when you use that word. It takes away from the fact that these individuals are either veterans or former teachers or mothers, fathers, sons, daughters. So I started asking them, hey, let's, let's use a different word because these members are still part of our community. Therefore, they're still our neighbors. And if you were to look up just the definition of the word neighbors, it means someone who lives next to us or close to us. Mm -hmm which is them, they live close to us. So that's just a shift in vocabulary that has a little bit more of a compassionate approach. Um, I also ask them and I challenge them that when they go out and when they hear the people use that, that word, the word homeless, say, hey, you know, let's, let's change the vocabulary here. Um, I also have taken it upon myself that every time I'm in an arena and close to a politician that I also ask them to start shifting yes. their vocabulary too. It wasn't too long ago where I was with Lieutenant Governor Josh Green, and I had just read this article, and the media kept using the word sweeps. So when we're at home, what do we sweep, Wendy? Yes. Right? The unwanted, sweep trash. Yeah, the trash. Right? Exactly. So now we're using this word sweep when we're out on the streets and when they're doing these community cleanup projects that they're sweeping these individuals who are unsheltered. So why are we using that word? It just, it's hurtful to our society, right? It inflicts even more wounds and it, it even puts on more labels to people who really, that's not what's needed. Um, so I, I addressed this with the kids and they were really, really great. I encouraged them to participate in different community projects, whether it be starting a canned good drive at their school whether it be participating at beach cleanup down at their, their beach there at Kailua Beach, because I was at Kailua, uh, Kalahale High School in this picture. And I also asked them like, you know, when you are starting your career in college and starting your careers and going out professionally, use your voice. When you recognize these needs, use your voice. Um, and also start developing some mental and, and emotional intelligence. And that's going to be through lived experiences. So go out and experience what these people. I didn't encourage them to go and like start experiencing what homelessness is like, but just to go out and start having conversations with them and sharing a meal and, you know, again, starting the conversation. Wow. So Susan, you're absolutely right. You know, I mean, just changing the verbiage that we're using and that we're so used to using. And then like what you're doing, you're starting with the young people, the students, the younger generation, so that they start off, you know, with the right terminology and we don't mislabel uh, our friends, our neighbors in the street. And so again, I commend you for that. Continue to do that. Um, you uh, sharing that with the politicians and the people of uh, influence in our community, powerful because they are on TV and they make an impact on so many people. So of course, 
you're you hit it right in the head, man. Just keep going with that message, and I think a lot of different uh, outcomes will occur because of just changing the verbiage. So I'm so excited. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and by the way, just to let you know, Lieutenant Governor Josh Green was so receptive, and he's been really on the forefront in addressing that. Oh, he has. I've seen him on TV on trying to uh, resolve the problems, you know, um, some of the situations on the street, and uh, again commending him for his efforts as well. So on our next slide, Susan, there's a gentleman and you guys look so happy. What are you guys so happy about? <laughs> so I, I, I know there's a few pictures, which, what does this gentleman look like? Does he have a beard? Uh, he's the one or... with the white beard and you guys are hugging and he looks happy, happy. Yeah, oh, his name is Michael and he's so special. So um, Homemade Hawaii had a construct, or they still do, they're still building that, the Kaleloa. Um, the, the Kauhale out at Kaleloa of the 36 tiny homes. And prior to the, the construction, I would go out and I would meet with those that were living in the tents and the encampment out there. And Michael was, is 72 years old. He's a Vietnam vet. And I'm born in Vietnam. I was born in Vietnam in Saigon. And so we just sat and started talking story about um, Vietnam and, and how long he was there and, and the sense of loss with his buddies that uh, he basically grew up in Vietnam in his 20s, right? And then when he came back, life was actually very different. He wasn't well received back into the States because he was a soldier in Vietnam and number two, because he was African, African American. So he, he struggled quite a bit. But in the picture, we're smiling because one of the things he just asked for, he goes, can I just have a hug? And I said, sure, I would love to hug you. And he just gave me one of the biggest and one of the best hugs I had, I've ever had. It was just, he gave me such a gift that day. And he just walked me around and he said he wanted to be my escort and chaperone around the encampment and just introduced me to everybody. And it was just a really nice day with him. Wow. And you know, Susan, you know, we go to these locations, these uh, communities and we're going there and we are thinking we're going to make an impact and make a difference in their lives. But the, the gifting part of it all is when you go there and you receive something like that, that you've not experienced in a long time, I tell you, that's what continues, I'm sure, and it continues to propel you to want to do more. Just having that hug and making a positive impact in someone's life that day. I mean, that's so powerful. So again. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, right. it was so much fun. Right. Yeah. I know you advocate for women in need. I know that, that when I saw you in a, uh, the first time in a long time, that was your passion. You were driving that force and um, men and women, but I know the women in need is close to your heart. So please share with us their mission and why you are so passionate about that. So women in need have three shelters here on the island of Oahu and also a shelter on the island of Kauai. And they take women in that are that are removing themselves and their children from a domestic violence environment, which takes a lot of courage. Women in shelter also uh, work with women that are coming out of the penal system and that are taking their time to reintegrate and to do so again with integrity, which is really, really imperative. Women in need, number one, provides safe shelter. Number two, provides a place to where there's healing, there's an opportunity to be vulnerable in a safe place. And what I mean by be vulnerable, they have to get to the point where they can share their stories. And our stories are gifts, by the way, Wendy. When we share these stories, we are the ones that get to choose who we share that story with. And that person should be able to hold the space for our shame stories, our hurts, our pain, and still just love. Women in need. It's really special. They also help women get back on their feet, reunite with children that have been separated through CPS, and also provide employment um, rehabilitation to where they get skills and they, they help them with their resumes and get them back working and employed. Um, they're really, really amazing. Uh, and this is a critical part of their journey where all the hearts come together and just love on them and listen to them. And really help them to just get back, you know, to what they, where they want to be, I should say. Um, very critical. And so all these components that you're putting together and not just loving them and hugging on them, but also just spending the time to listen to them and, and feel their hurt. 
because they have felt it for so long alone, but you're there now with them as well as all these support groups. So again, I'm very aware of many of them. Um, I'm so excited that you're working directly with them as well. And it just feels that big puka in our hearts because we want to make a difference, a positive difference. So Susan, we talk about this open heart and I, I love the term open heart. That's my favorite term of all. So why is it so important to listen with an open heart? It's so easy when we're having a conversation, we're only not completely present, right? Because we've got so much going on. So we're thinking about many other things and we're not just really just absorbing what is being shared with us. And again, these stories are gifts. So to listen with an open heart and just be there with no judgment, no opinion, but just to be there with love. And again, it requires you to open your heart to do that. Uh -oh. So what's next for you, Susan? I know you, you, you've done many things. You, you, we didn't even talk about what you do professionally, um, but if you want to dive into that, uh, we have some time for that. Just share with us, what are your, your, your goals and your dreams that you want to make happen? So I have a couple things. I'm writing a book right now, and the whole premise is to talk about what happens when abuse goes untreated. So that's on my plate. But I'm working on a really, really neat project that I would love to even come back and maybe share with your, your viewers a little bit more. Mm -hmm. But it's for Ho'olanopua. Ho'olanopua is a safe haven that uh, is providing housing and trauma care for young girls that have been trafficked and, and sexually trafficked. And it's prevalent here more in Hawaii than it is anywhere in the United States. And we are preparing to have a celebrity auction that will go live in January. And we want viewers to come, your viewers or any supporters to come and bid on celebrity experiences, for instance, like golfing with Mar Marcus Mariota, um, having Chef Chai come to your house and teach you how to, to make a really nice gourmet meal. And all the funding that will be raised will go towards the trauma care for these young girls. Wow. So um, any celebrities out there listening, we need you, um, whether it's for a, a luncheon or a dinner or just whatever you can to assist because the, the need is great. And we always think that this situation is not in our state, but we're definitely wrong about that. And I think more knowledge and information has been coming out that it's right here in our backyards, in our front yards. And so we better be made more aware of it. Um, once the awareness is there, then of course the need to support and help um, these women and men through this time of their lives. I mean, it's so critical. So if anyone can reach out and help, we are gonna have some information where Susan has her um, direct contacts that you can get in touch with her and um, just reach out. And she's taking all her time and her energies. And I think even your professional life, uh, Susan, you can talk a little bit about that. What do you do? I mean, like, if you don't mind, I know you're writing the book, but there is also another way that you reach out to people. You wanna share a little bit about that? Sure. I have a company called The Social Touch, which is a social media marketing agency. I specialize in branding and rebranding on social media. However, when people really ask me, what is it that you really do? Well, I, uh, I collect stories. Again, I sit and I listen with an open heart and I collect stories of your service and your products and I highlight them on social media. I think that's so powerful. You know, um, as I was building another business after I retired, I would sit at Kahala Mall and you'd be surprised. I would sit at the mall and just mind my business and look like I'm busy. And for some reason, um, especially the seniors, they would come and sit down with me and they would just talk. And they would tell me everything about their kids, about their ailments, medical issues, all these things. And I'm like, an hour has gone by and I'm still talking story. And I'm like so involved with their conversation. And you know, I would say to them before they had to go or before I had to go, so what does your son or your daughter say about all these things? And they said, I can't tell them. I said, why not? And they said, she says, oh, because they're too busy to hear me. So it's so, so important, Susan, what you're doing, you know, when they, especially when you see a young person like yourself going out and reaching out, people really want to feel this and experience this. And it's not just the elder community, but it's, everyone the young generation right now especially they need to just fill that void especially with the last year that everyone experienced so i mean i'm so grateful to you susan for reaching out is there another story that you would like to share with us that has made an impact in your life 
um, up to this point. There's so many. So yeah, so just by the way, let me update you guys on the story on Christina that I had yes. shared earlier. So this woman has earned her degree in culinary arts and she has now opened a food truck and it is out in Y and I. So I just wanted to give her a little props. Um, I don't know the name of the food truck, but where is I'm she just, parked? I don't know. I just know it's okay. Y&I. It's just been in the last week that this has oh, happened. Oh, okay. That's so, important because, you know, right. I'm always out on the West side and I want to go and support Anytime I can support um, a great part like this and a great story, I'm going to go there and then I'm going to say, I want to order a hug. <laughs> and I'm going <laughs> to I love it. Yes. Hug. I'm going to order how many? Uh, can I have two hugs, please? Uh, super strong and never stop. So right? come out and give me a hug and then I'll order my lunch later. But I love that. Yeah. So what we'll do, guys, if you do want to support um, this young woman as well, Get in touch. We have Susan's information. You yes. have mine. And then, Susan, you have some homework. Now that I you do. let the cat out of the bag, you're going to get us the location of the name of her truck. And we'll go give her a hug and give her some love that. and enjoy her Ono food. Because those are the stories that we really want to support. And I just, yeah, thank you so much. And also, before we um, sign off, which is coming up soon, I do want to mention that how long has I have I known you, Susan? Okay. 29 years <laughs> <laughs> at least 29 years right so yeah. a long time so i met susan when she was a contestant in our miss hawaii international and that was in the year 92 oh, 1992 <laughs> she, we crowned her in 1992 and you know what if she puts the crown on right now you think she still is a reigning queen because she's kept her youth her vitality her beauty and her heart, which is even more beautiful. And I think that's the secret to what you're doing. Your heart is beautiful and your heart is open. So you're wearing your heart on your sleeves, Susan. So never stop. Being in that pageant just allowed you to open the doors that uh, you never thought were going to be open or was open. And now you're in the door and you're going to make such a difference to more and more people that you come across. So never stop doing what you're doing. All right. Thank you, Wendy. Yeah. You're just, at, you're just, you're more beautiful. You're amazing. I love you. I love you. And I'm so I glad that we still are friends after all these many years. So yes. I'm grateful. Thank so you. Right now we've come to an end of the show. I'm going to have to leave us for now. But as I said, and as you mentioned, you'd like to come back. And when you have more information about Ho'olanapua, then of course we want to know about that. And anybody that wants to donate or volunteer, please. Um, it's not coming up until, is it August? Is that correct? So the, the auction will go live in January. January. Oh, so we have some time. We have we some time, but I still need to get those donations in. Right. And I know that you spoke to our dear friend, Chef Chai, and uh, he's yeah. kind of thinking about it or he's going to do it. He said he'll do it. Yes. And you know, another thing, great thing about Chef Chai is he's willing to employ these individuals that have gone through these programs. Yes. Yes. And any employers who right now they're looking for, for employees, you do get a $2,000 tax deduction. Yes. For employing individuals. Right. That I've explained that goes through these yeah. programs. And Chai, he's right on the on on the mark with that. He's always had that heart, whether the two thousand yes, he does. He and that's the kind of heart that we're looking for right now. So a shout out to all of you An out there. An open heart. An yeah. open heart. So you've been watching Taking Your Health Back on Think Tech Hawaii. Mahalo to Susan from Social Touch. Thanks for talking story with us. And mahalo to all our viewers for watching. I'm Wendy Lowe. And we'll be back in two weeks with another edition of Taking Your Health Back. Aloha, everyone.